Welcome each and every one of you to this day two workshop on edible insects of Northeast India. This morning, our first technical session was supposed to start from 10 to 10 30 and uh, took late by 10 minutes. For whatever it is, we should start. And today, the first technical session, the topic is on know what insect we eat. Uh, we eat. And our speaker will be. Uh, Mrs. Anungla Pongana, who is none other than um, my, uh, my dear friend, my colleague, Department of Zoology, Thomas Science College. And then this morning, um, our first technical sessions will be chaired by the defendant arm. Before I introduce him, but before that, um, we shall have a short introduction from the participants. And I would like to request to stand from the seat to say your name and for where you are coming. Since we have not known each other well, so now I'll just give time to our participants to introduce yourself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Kermitian Bibi and I'm from Karbion District of Africa. And I'm a social worker. This also gives me your interest in edibles. What are your interest in doing? Um actually uh it is my fault. I want to attend this kind of uh, um, workshop and uh why I came is that I wanted to more to know more about the Thank you. Um good morning and hello everyone. Uh, I'm Salivanti Mumpi. Uh, I'm also from West Cardinal District of Um so uh, even for me also it's the first time I'm attending such a workshop on edible insects and uh, like uh, in our tribe, you know, uh, we, uh, I'm not like the community, uh, which is also one of the indigenous community in the uh, northeastern states. Uh, we, we also do have, uh, you know, edible insects, but uh, we are not aware of, you know, uh, the names and all. We just know that uh, it can be uh, edible. It, it is edible. Uh, so uh, I also have, another, you know, keen interest on uh, learning and to explore more on uh, uh, edible insects of Northeast India. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Vipal Nama. I'm from Arunachal. Um, I don't have much interest in insects, but after doing the film, I uh, interest. Well, I'm just seeing you. Hi everyone, my name is Akam. I I did my research recently and uh, my interest here is you can look for options for startups that's in the farming. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm John Wichitan from Dinapur. Uh, the reason that I'm here is to uh, 
meet people, uh, like collaborate with them. And then my interest in sex came to me last year when I started collaborating with the global community on future of food. So that, that's why I'm here. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Joy England. I'm from the Food Caribbean on the Street of Assam. Uh, why do I came here is because like being an Indian and being a tribal, I ate the sex. Uh, so that uh, I, why I came here is I want to know more about the sex and things. So uh, thank you so much. Have a good day. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Rocky. So I'm from Manipur. So in Manipur, like mostly we we eat insects from the uh, water, mostly found in the water. So that's it. And I'm also a greener fellow that we do documenting. So it may be helping our journey, so that's why I came for this uh, book. So. Hi everyone, good morning. <coughs> My name is King Thompson Max and I'm from Manipur. Right now uh, I'm ready insects, crickets and black for supply. Uh, why I write cricket is uh, I just want to revive the old traditions of eating insects. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Kesirigo Yetu. I'm a CPT. I'm working on, uh, on the Jack of Law. And I'm the community resource person. I'm also interested in our production. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Patricia. Uh, presently, I'm pursuing my PhD in Nagaland University. And then I'm working, uh, trying to work on uh, rearing some edible insects in Nagaland. And then I believe this is the right platform to meet people who are interested in the same thing I am. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, I'm, I'm a research scholar from the University. I'm here because I support our uh, animal Good morning, everyone. I am Robin Omoji. I just submitted my thesis on edible insects from Nagaland University. And uh, I have been really looking forward to this workshop and then the rearing of grasshoppers and for net domestication was what really, I mean, apart from the other technical session, this two topic really interested me. And as I have been, this edible insects has been my interest since my master's. So after doing it, I am really looking forward for this mass production, mass domestication, traditional harvesting, and this sustainability, and also socioeconomic uh, importance of this edible insects. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Indi Yanda, and I'm from Dim Sum. Um, to be honest, uh, I'm allergic to most of the insects, but then uh, coming here, I'm learning uh, so much, and uh, I'm looking forward to learn more. And uh, being an unemployed, I'm looking you know, for uh, after learning from here, I'm looking mm. for, to start something. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a very important point. You said you are allergic to many insects. Yeah. So, by eating insects, or uh, what kind of allergy and how, how your body reacts to it? Yeah, uh, even this morning, uh, I, as I was, you know, cleaning my room, and, you know, I just saw and I don't know, I don't know the name of that insect, but then, but just by looking at it, I got an allergy. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I'm in here. Allergy or aversion? <laughs> and uh, sometimes uh, by eating also, uh, the, um, yesterday one of uh, our speakers, she shot a flying termite, so I get allergy by eating that also. And moths and all those. <laughs> yeah. Hello everyone, good morning. Uh, I am Alpha Tully and uh, I am from this very college, Kerma Science College, Zoology uh, Department. Good morning everyone, I'm Kizzy, I'm from this very college itself, Zoology Department. Uh, why am I attending this workshop is because I'm working on my dissertation that uh, the topic is Eatable in Cycle in the Water District. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to learn more from this workshop. Hello uh, everyone, my name is Kirin Kamal. I'm doing my master's here at the very end. Hello everyone, my name is Peter Bonino. I'm currently doing my MBC in Science College and I'm working on preservation in Edible MC. Good morning, my name is Peter Bonino and I'm from this college itself. Now uh, I'm doing my MSc in the modern 
Hello, I'm myself and I'm from this world college. And the reason I'm here is after attending this program, I can know more about insects. In my locality, we find many insects, but we hardly consume only a few uh, four species. But after this program, I can tell my people that these are vegetables and very expensive. Let's be concerned as well. My name is Zulu Darako. I'm from the district. I'm currently pursuing my LB Koma College. I'm very much interested in learning this kind of species. That's why I attended this workshop. A very good morning to you all. Uh, my name is Mila Povese. And I came from Loza Blue Lake under Pink District. And this year, I completed Master of Science. And this workshop, what excites me the most is that uh, most of the insects out here are available in my respective villages, and I'm very happy to know that they're edible and consumable, and like their work safe. Thank you. Hello, good morning. My name is Polly Achimi, and uh, I'm uh, one of the uh, teaching faculty from Model Christian College, and I came here to learn and broaden my knowledge about edible insects. Uh, good morning to you all. My name is Alex Mo. Uh, I was a part of this edible insect team. Uh, yes, a part of <laughs> this team, and uh, I came to learn more about this. Hello, my name is Sojan Otopoi from Boka District, and uh, I'm honestly very interested in insects, um, especially consuming it. <laughs> So um, I came here to learn or uh, to discover more about edible insects, which I don't know of, so that in the future, you know, when I go back home, I can tell my family that okay, this insect is also edible. We can go hunt for them. <laughs> Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Francis Vincent, and I'm pursuing my master's in this college itself. Thank you so much for organizing this workshop and there is so many things I'm looking forward to learn more in order to thank you. Good morning everyone. My name is Pamela Lumba, student of Coma Science College itself, and this is my first time attending this kind of uh, workshop uh, and in Edinburgh and, and even yesterday I learned so much new and I'm looking forward to have a productive session. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Nikilia and I'm doing my master in this college itself and uh, yeah, I came to learn and also to what I've learned I'm like giving back to the society. Hi everyone, my name is Shamo and I'm doing MSc in zoology in this very college, taking entomology as my special paper. And through yesterday's program I learned a lot and I'm really encouraged to work on insect and yeah, I'm hoping to learn more today. Thank you. Okay, thank you all to all the participants for their self introductions and also your interest in this workshop. This morning, um, our session will be chaired by Dr. Brendan House, Associate Professor in the Nairobi University, Department of Zoology, and also heading as the head of the department. Actually, he is not new to me, um, he's my a dear friend of mine, a uh, best of 1992 of this college, and we were also together for the post graduate meeting, uh, 1994 batch. And I remember that during that batch, we were uh, 17 of us, and out of that, he was the only man, and we love people call him James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, one of the professors to call him the devil of the Department of Zoology, so he was a center point for everyone. <laughs> and then, uh, 1995, I got a job in this college, and then he uh, pursued his PhD. And in 1998, he joined Nagaland University. And I don't, everyone know him, and you know he's a very he's a simple man and a high thinking with a high thinking. And under him, I would like to say that uh, under him, um, he has two PhD scholars being completed and five PhD scholars still working under him. 
There's so much to say about him, but I will not take the time. And straight away, I think I would like to hand over the time to our chairperson, Dr. Ben Amal. Mm -hmm. He can come and take the time. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Mm -hmm. No, 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 my voice is loud enough. So we want for online viewers. Oh, I have to uh, It's a joy to be back in my alma mater. I have very fond memories of this place. The good ones, the bad ones. But fond memories nonetheless. Um, I'm grateful to Dr. Rajan and his team from Archie for inviting me to chair this session. Uh, since yesterday, we have had lots of interesting topics. We have heard uh, speakers from the business field. What are the areas that need thinking about? The potential is there, no doubt. This through this workshop, what we are discussing and deliberating about, something will come up. The important thing is that questions should be raised, then answers will follow. Uh, we've also heard uh, talks on rearing and domestication of products. We have seen the potential. Forget about the, the alternative food uh, source, protein source, potential is there even for commercial, uh, commercialization. Hmm. Now, uh, we are only running late. It's 10.30 now. So what? Uh, so you have a, what do you call it? Uh, have an hour? The speaker? Yeah, 30 minutes. Yes. Now, let me introduce, without much ado, she's a dear friend of mine. We were together for a long time. Uh, she's an associate professor here, Brahman of Zoology. She's working on uh, edible insects. Her research field is edible insects, and she has Quite a good number of publications in research journals. She also has a chapter uh, published. So, madam, the stage is yours. Make it, make you the note of the time, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, once again. I hope you had a good night rest last night. Um, at the very onset, I want to thank the, the EFI team, especially the organizers, for uh, inviting me to be one of the speakers in the technical session. I feel to be very honest, uh, unworthy to be here, but anyway, <coughs> I think on virtue of what I did, on what I have researched on, at least I can uh, contribute a little bit on this edible insect that uh, we find in our place. So our workshop is on edible insects of Northeast India, and this technical session, the topic is know what insects you eat. So it is about the insect which is found in uh, Nagaland. That was what was relayed to me by our organizer, Dr. Priyan, uh, to share with you today. Um, So this is, this will be just an introduction to the insects that, not all the insects, but some of the insects in particular, uh, that, it, that is found in, uh, found and consumed in Nagaland, okay, in general. So this is, you can meet him, Mr. 
a long horn reindeer here, uh, not reindeer, <laughs> just like a reindeer here, long horn reindeer, okay? So, um, and this, and this, uh, one thing, you know, what I want you, what I want, my expectation from this session is that uh, it will be more of a giving, okay, from the participants, especially we have very eminent resource persons here, and also some of our delegates from outside. I will, uh, I expect you to, you know, uh, put in some of the information, your invaluable information, uh, as I go on with this presentation, and also, you know, feedbacks okay, from you all. And so it will be less of me giving and more of you giving. Okay. So the purpose of this presentation is to showcase the popular insects eaten by people here in Nagaland. It may be, you know, consumed. Uh, for food, as food, or for therapeutic uses. So if you look at the uh, diversity, the insect kingdom is very vast, okay? It is said that there is about uh, 5 million species of insects in the world, but about 1.4 million is already identified, and out of this, only 5,000 species are considered harmful, and the rest if not that food, you know, then I think it can be edible also. Okay, so that is the uh, the information we which we have on insect diversity, and you know this uh, the entomophagy. Okay, the science of entomophagy actually can uh, popularity after the publication of insect as human food uh, by Gordon Hema in 1951. So in Nagaland, the most recent documentation about the edible insect is we have 106 species of insects as edible insects and uh, this covers 32 families and 9 orders. You can see here the distribution of edible insect orders in Nagaland. Auto Nata, eight species, Octoptera, 25, Nandudi, two, Platodi, one, Hemoptera, 23, Colotera, 15, Hemoptera, 25, Levitoptera, eight, and Uptera, one. So these are some of the species, the insects which are edible and found in Nagaland. Dragon beans, sand cricket, Cayenne, Gavidids, Termites, Pink Bugs, we have the Grasshoppers, the Water, Beetle, Aquatic Insects. So many varieties are there which is yet to be identified. Okay, The larva of which insect we have not yet. It, it, the resources are very vast. Okay? We still have to work on it. And we have good larva, it may be of Lepithoptera or Colotera, okay, so many varieties of larva is there, which is edible. Then we have the ant, the bees, the webs, again, more larva. Now here, the present trend of anthropophagy in Nagaland. Currently, as we all know, it is harvested from the wild, okay, it is collected and uh, eaten, okay, consumed or sold, okay, and it is collected from agricultural crops also, where it inhabits as a pest, okay. Now again, this, talking about the participants, okay, the consumers, we have in the rural areas, okay, the villagers, who are the collectors, the sellers, as well as the consumers. And those people in the urban, we are participants as consumers only. Okay? Because we don't have the, uh, you know, the resources from where we could get the, uh, the 
collect the insect. It is in the village where they have, you know, the nearby uh, fields, they have the forest from where they could, they could collect and then, um, you know, sell it or eat it. So, edible insects have the potential to improve rural livelihood, okay, specifically, okay. Uh, in general, it may be for everybody also, even for the for that matter, young entrepreneurs who are educated, they can also, I think, you know, if we can solve the problem of pro procurement of these uh, insects, okay, um, like mass production, mass rearing, I'm sure we could, you know, uh, uh, get the avenue for livelihood, even for young people like you. So it is a, it can be a source of income. You know, find marketing it. What about the attitude? We have talked so much about you know this attitude, the perception, like it is distress, uh, yeah, distress or ill feeling, the revulsion. But for me, you know, when what, what I was working on it and was on the field, it was more of, you know, acceptance, even by the consumers and the non-consumers. So yesterday I was just listening, but uh, I could not, uh, I thought that maybe my time will come to share my, uh, you know, the, this, the thing which I have observed from the field. So it is, more, in other land, I tell you, it is more of acceptance, not this uh, revulsion or that you are feeling, okay? It, it will be there, okay? But it is very minimal. They accept it. You know, they, they don't uh, refrain from me. They will, you know, even if I don't eat, I will come people around me to eat it. It is like that, okay? So we are very free, actually. You know, we can do so much. We have so much potential, and we can do freely on this cultivation and selling also, okay? There is. There is so much of you don't have to feel ashamed or you don't have to feel you know something that hesitation should not be there if we really have the interest for this uh, uh, entrepreneurship into this field of selling uh, edible insects. There is the attitude of acceptance from both consumers as well as non-consumers. <coughs> and I think the reason behind this acceptance is for us, Naga tribals, uh, the use of insect as food has been in practice, you know, since it is traditional food actually. That's why. Then we have the type of insects which I have already uh, shown you in the slide. There are again some group of insects uh, which are available in some areas only. And I think it is because of certain Factors like availability of the host plant, the, uh, the climatic condition, okay, so on and so forth. Factors are there. And these are the things I uh, observe. Carpenter's worm and giant hornet are more, uh, you know, sort of, and then it is more available in Kohima and in that area. Okay, this is the strip. And then 10 caterpillars in Nopukchong and Zanipoto. Then I have the red ant, uh, this, which is plentifully available in uh, Limapur and also in some hot places, okay, in Nopukchong area also, and maybe even in other places also, okay, Zanipoto, yeah. They try very well in warm places. Then we have the larvae, you know, it is found everywhere, Colaptera, you know, Lepidoptera, so on and so forth. So, like yesterday, it was already uh, said that mass cultivation is worldwide. You know, the practice of mass, mass cultivation of insects, of peas and silkworm. Okay, it is done all over the world, and even in Nagaland, we see mass cultivation of peas and airy silkworm as well as milk silkworm. Usually the peas, they are being uh, cultivated, they've been farmed for 12 purpose and most for the production of honey. 
get for the production of money. But if you look at the uh, the um, the food value, the proximate analysis of the food nutrients in the pig, there is one uh, particular uh, report that is on the uh, the food value in Apis mellifera. Okay, if its protein is 21 percent per 100 grams of type, uh, you know, matter, then we have fed 20 percent. So you can see uh, the value from here, how, uh, you know, useful, how uh, nutritious even the honey tree is. Okay, we are not talking about the honey, how uh, useful it is, but about the it's a, it's a. Then we have the um, the silkworm, okay, and it is available throughout the year, okay. And then uh, this is rare uh, nowadays, mostly for food purposes, okay. Before, but uh, I don't know about the other district, but in um, Mokokchong, okay, there's a project going on and then there is mass production of this soup as well as the cocoon so that they will, you know, spawn the cocoon uh, into silk thread. Okay, it's going on now. So, though mo mostly it is uh, harvested or it is cultured, it is reared for food purposes, things are changing and then they are now also cultivated to procure the cocoon for silk production. Okay, that is happening in Nagaland also. So we have avenues here, okay, which if you are interested, you can venture into. And the proximate composition of this airy silkworm protein 16 fat at again at person. Okay, so you can see it is again very significant. Then we have the sting bugs. There are so many types of sting bugs. I I um, I have I identified two of them here. Uh, I'll show them. We have the Corydia simulanus. Okay, these are the uh, the local name. Polo, Polo, Akano, Ao, Angami, and Sema. Okay. So we have a lot a lot of history on sting bugs. Is there? I think that one video was shown on how it was collected. The same thing happened here also, and during the winter time, usually it is collected from the rock, okay, by the side of the, uh, the rivers, and uh, during the swarm season, swarming season, that is, I think, uh, July to September, it is, uh, you know, they will be swarming on leaves, foliages, and all those, uh, in millions, I think, if not in thousands, okay, so that is, you will probably observe, so I don't have to be uh, involved into that, how it is uh, thought. So this is, and then, you know, uh, we've been talking about uh, this, some of the effects due to the consumption of the insects, and even this Corydia's single letters have uh, certain effects on certain people, especially it is said that by consumption of the male species, right, uh, it will have and this in, uh, this into, in, intoxicating effect on the person, you know, fever, uh, hallucination, all sort of thing. And if it is not triggered immediately, it may prolong for a year two like that. That is it, it, the effects. The side effect becomes uh, what very um, not short but long term side effect. Okay. So we have another sting bug, okay, this is a, uh, this is also called the lychee sting bug because it is, it resides, you know, it inhabits the lychee uh, plant. So if you, I have already esti uh, estimated the value, the approximate value of both these corridors uh, as well as uh, this, um, <coughs> this, this aratoma, uh, but Today I'm just going to show you the composition of these protein and fats in another two um, sting bar, okay? 
that is, and you can see here the value of the, the protein is 35 percent and 11 percent, and in the uh, the, the value of fat is 51 person and 38 person. So it is very high. Okay, the food value in the steam bath is very high. Okay, protein, you can have, just see here. Then also even the fat. So, you know, they can, they can make very good food supplements for us. Okay. Then this is also another uh, species uh, which we consume, okay? Patula, patuli. And I have noticed that they are available twice in a year, okay? February to May, and again, it emerges in, and this it disappears, then again it emerges in November and December. So we have actually, uh, you know, vast potentials for research work on this particular insect. This is how I was sketching them, okay, of three. So the, um, I, I wanted to show you this slide because I got some very important or very interesting information from this couple, okay, when I was doing research on this tapula. Um, though it is not scientifically proven, they said that uh, they use, she, ha she has very, you know, high diabetes, okay, ranging from, I think, 600 something. And then she uh, uh, took lots of treatment, okay, with med medicine, medical treatment, but it was not at all working. Then she started having this tartula, okay, fried, tried in many forms, and then it subsided suddenly within one week, you see, her sugar level. So it is not proven, but she believed, and then now she doesn't take any of the medical medicine or the prescribed medicine, and she's going for the tartula, uh, as Okay. So this is another insect which is found in all, uh, you know, I think districts of Nagaland. Usually the adult, the, if you look at the abdomen of the adult cicada, uh, it does not have much uh, mass in it. Okay, so it is the nim, which is, which, uh, you know, can be considered as uh, the uh, the insect, the name, okay, this uh, this stage as the insect of uh, food value, of food value, okay, name. It is very oily. It, I mean, it is very fatty, okay, and it is also, uh, I think, the when I estimated the value of protein, it was also quite significant. So this is how we collect the cicada, okay? So usually the this hemipterans or the cicada, the root protein, the average uh, ranges from 45 to 40, uh, 57 and fats 26 percent, okay? Then this is another, uh, the one which I have just mentioned in the beginning. These are more, you know, sought after for and then uh, found in Bogotong area and in Zanagoto area. Okay. So this is already processed, okay, and it is uh, it emerges in July to December, and from through the while, while doing the research work, it has been commented by some of the respondents that it is as tasty as chicken, though it looks creepy. So they don't mind the looks, okay? It's very tasty and they rather have this than caterpillar uh, as food than pork. That was their, you know, uh, their comment, their remarks, okay? So it is as tasty as chicken. So we have another one. We have talked a lot on this yesterday, carpenter's worm, okay? The protein. In general, average, the left in Nephitopteria, you will see the protein um, in 100 grams of this worm, 
the uh, 45% is protein and 27 is fats. Okay, and if you look at the history of the uh, the traditional use, you know, uh, its purpose for its use, it's immense and very interesting also. Then we have the longhorn beetle. I have introduced to you Mr. Longhorn in the beginning. So the larva of that, okay, so this one, it has so many uses, food, therapeutic, as well as it is used as feeds. Okay, it is collected and given to the chickens. So we have a lot of potential if we can harvest it, mass production, okay, of mass production. Use as food, it has therapeutic value also, but all these are not scientifically proven, but they still practice it, okay. And this one, uh, the proximate food composition, we have protein 50%, very high protein content, okay, and fat by significant 50%. So this is also another uh, larvae of a people, and it resides in the yam plant, okay, yam plant. In the form of the young plant, Kuchupata, you know that, right? So, the, if you look at the approximate values again, protein is 40% and fat is 44. Very high content of fats, okay? Very high content. And one of the villagers, one of the respondents, he said that, see, we are very poor people, we cannot afford meat, you know, the, con the conventional meat products. So usually I go and collect this and you know supplement uh, my living needs with this. That was the comment here. So this is the red end. Ucophila spirochina. This is the market from here I procured. I went even to the jungle to procure more of this end. Fruit protein it is 55% and fruit fat 15%. So, you know, all these edible insects, if you look at the composition, you can, the, you know, the food value it is very uh, significant, very high. And we can, you know, 100% assure that it can supplement our needs for protein and fats. Okay? And they are more healthy, I feel. Okay, regardless of some of us, you know, unfortunately getting uh, allergy from it. Then we have cricket. I have identified two of them, the quillus researchers, which have uh, the fruit protein uh, estimated as 58 percent and the fat 10 percent. Okay. Then again, I. I did my work on this one, Dublin Scalus protein process. And this one, 52% protein and fat is 26. Okay. So I just uh, here this table, uh, I compared the food value of this Dublin Scalus, this cricket, with that of the value of these elements with the uh, this mineral elements, iron, calcium, copper, magnesium, uh, um, potassium, right, sodium, zinc, with uh, this conventional meat products. And you can see here the yellow thing, sorry, the yellow, highlighted yellow thing, in iron, copper, and Mg, the Composition is higher than those conventional meat products. And if you look at the others also, calcium, uh, except so sodium, it is quite uh, commendable. Okay, is composition of the other elements, calcium, potassium, and zinc. Then again, if you look at the, it's, you know, um, recommended calorie allowances or its fulfillment. Okay, 
that is recommended by the Food and Nutrition Board Institute of Medicine. You can see that for, for iron, it is more than 100 percent. The lowest, the, yes, the best column, row. And even for iron, for copper, and for zinc, it is more than 100 percent. And for the others, it is acceptable. So you can see even the tithery uh, needs can be met by this particular insect itself, cricket. And uh, one one of our fellow delegates from Manipur, he said that his interest is in wearing uh, cricket in mass production. And it will be so good of uh, our you know fellow uh, participants if he could share with us about this cricket. I would like to hear from him also. So this is uh, Prasupas, okay? We have so many species of seven, eight, nine, I think more than nine or ten species of Prasupa, which is edible and found in Nagaland. And this is just one Prasupa, okay? With the approximate uh, value, protein 44% and fat 48%. So, you know, it is very impressive the amount of nutrient which these uh, insects carries in them, okay? I don't have to say much on that. Okay, the fruit protein is 25, fat 12. Okay. Then again, you know, when I had this survey during my field work, I had the survey and uh, and then I followed the random sampling method. And then uh, if you can look at this, the consumerism, okay, out of the 400 uh, respondents, you can see here. Uh, except this aplo aplosonics, that is the uh, corn borer, the kuchu one, the larva of which infest the kuchu of kuchu plant, okay, that's yam, all is very high, the consumption is very high, okay, 72, 21, 48, 55, 70, 90, 95, 52, 48, 87, 54. So you can see the consumerism, you know, from the 40 per 400 respondents, the percentage of, you know, participants of this consumption of insect is very high. So, you know, we don't have to uh, feel down or, you know, uh, hesitant about doing great things on these edible insects, okay? Entrepreneurship, research work, or just as a common people, you know, talking about it. And it is now, as I said, uh, uh, in the uh, introductory session, our um, fellow Dr. Priyan also said that uh, even FAO has, you know, recommended highly on you know, this consumption of insect, okay, as food supplement, as well as to boost the economy of a country. So just highlighting some of the work which I did on this during my research work, just preliminary experiment, rarely gotten this worm, okay, I did some work on this, and it lasted for eight months, and then uh, uh, because it was pretend, uh, you know, relevant. Um, when I did this kind of experiment, this very, uh, I did with a purpose that will fulfill some of my research work on. Okay, so I I may, I may not be able to have the answer to all the questions that may be raising in your mind at the moment. Okay, then very then caterpillar semi cultivation I did. I did wearing it at home also, okay, and also observing it in the wild, okay. So all this uh, I did for the 10th particular, because I think this is the least studied uh, uh, edible insect as far as I know of. Most of them are not studied at all. You know, in Nagaland, we don't have uh, scholars, uh, many scholars who did research work. I know our my fellow research worker, Lobeno, who did a very substantial uh, work on the documentation under our 
uh, Indian professor, Mr. Kakati. And um, besides that, I don't know at the moment. Okay, maybe uh, I like a little knowledge on that, but not much information is there. So my conclusion is that we should, you know, why why should we opt for this edible insect as ultimate food? Because it is very rich in protein. Okay, protein, and it can promote the economy of our country also, especially for young people, unemployed youth. This is an opportunity. I feel like that if we can, you know. Find the technique, the method to rear, okay, and produce in mass, okay. And it can be also a uh, the answer as livelihood for those uh, economically marginalized people in the rural areas. See, if you look at the retail price of this edible insect in Nagaland. It is very exorbitant. The price is very exorbitant, very high. Okay, whereas conventional meat, meat products, it is okay. Okay, three hundred rupees for pork, two hundred fifty for beef, and uh, one seventy rupees for one kg of fish. So you can see, you just cannot compare. You know the the price different. Uh, the price here, it's just too high. And you know if you produce. If you can mass produce, I have a feeling that many of our people will automatically turn to endomorphism. I think I can say that very clearly. And this uh, Chayan hornet, it is considered as a, a as food only for the rich people. We, it, it is a tasty food. I think my favorite is this. Thailand market, okay. But we cannot afford it. I don't know how many of us have tested it for how long, you know? When was the last you tested you tested it? It's like that. It's so expensive. So you know if you get mass product, you know, produce it in mass, okay? If you can rear for mass production, I have a feeling that the price will come down also. It will come down. And the prospect of this insect culture, I think we can do a lot of work on this Ecophilia spirophyta, that is a red ant, the tan caterpillar, we can still research on it. We have the cricket, we have the carpenter's worm, we have the Chinese, uh, Chinese hornet, we have the tartula harpiki, we have the long horn beetle, you know, do research work, you know. Um, on their taxonomy, their habit, their habitat, their life cycle, reactivity, and method of rearing. Okay? This is the scopes that we have on edible insects at the moment. So that is all from my part. So I expect you to give a lot of feedback and you know, uh, information on, uh, on your side also. No question. Five is here. Uh, due to paucity of time, I want to limit the number of sessions. So, please raise your hand. Uh, those who want to any any questions or questions. Hello, uh, I have one question. I just wanted to ask you. You said that Corydias you found under rocks, right? Corydias singer Yeah, yeah. You found under rocks. So I'm curious that these uh, bugs are phytophages, right? So, did you see any nymphal stage under the rock, or you just found only adults? Just the adults. So, yeah. have you the ever stage only. Okay. So, have you ever seen any nymphal stage or life cycle of Corydia? No. 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 Yeah, that's why I have asked so many questions on this, and even the local people, they are not. It just come like that. Some say that you know they come. First of all, they swarm. On the trees, the foliages, and as it progress, you know, as days goes by, it comes down to the uh, trunk level. Then it will uh, migrate to the rivers. But I don't know whether it's true or not. Okay. 
So I cannot correlate the coming first swarming the trees, the vegetables, and then finally, you know, do die they come to the uh, towards the river bank and then uh, hide themselves under the rock, okay, moist uh, rock, something like that. So I'm not sure, but about the their life cycle, I have no idea. So what's the ideal uh, season for corridors? Pardon? What's the ideal season? When do you find corridors like swami or under the rocks? Swami so in June to July of the September, somewhere in that area. Okay. Usually, it seems the swami will occur uh, on certain years when the uh, bamboo will bloom. Okay. Bamboo blooming doesn't happen every year. So the year the bamboo bloom, it will swarm. The swami will take place. That was what they said. But about the life research, I have no idea. We need to do a lot of work in this section of the. Uh, this particular so insect. these insects also sell in the market, right? So market usually they collect it for their own consumption, but if they collect in large amount, like you have seen in the uh, yesterday video, I think uh, they sell it. They sell it so the what's market. the ideal rate for that insect? Let us limit ourselves to few questions. There, there might be others. Yeah. 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 Please. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for your excellent presentation. And I have seen that you have made an attempt to uh, domesticate and like rear uh, like certain insects. Now my interest is uh, after this. Do you have any plan to uh, like promote this pilot scale, uh, pilot uh, your research to a kind of operational scale where it can be done at a commercial scale? Of course, I am very much interested because I have made lots of observation. But this was, as I said, just preliminary uh, lab work which I did, or field work which I did. And I have a, I feel that, I believe that there is lots of scope on this. And I want to proceed, continue, yes. Madam, I have one, just one question to you. Uh, what method did you uh, uh, apply in your biochemical estimation of protein and the lipids? Uh, for protein, it was gel gel, gel gel distillation, and for and for lipids. For lipids, it was the chocolate. And I found that in found, uh, in some insects, you get twenty percent of protein, and in some insects, you get the sixty percent of protein. Yes. Is there any reason of this kind of wide difference? Uh, I think it's I don't know. Maybe it's because of their their body composition, right? The physiology as well as the food intake, the type of food they take in. Okay, but I'm not. I have not gone into that. Why it is you know it fluctuates so much twenty, whereas in some it is sixty. Uh, I cannot okay. answer uh, that. Whether you use it in dry matter basis or dry matter, it is in dry matter. Okay. Mm -hmm. You want to move questions? I, I believe they are done. So, can you share a little more about your experience, experiments about rearing longhorn beetles? I did not rear longhorn, or did I? No, no, I did not. I rear, um, I tried to rear, that is, uh, the carpenter's worm and the tank worm. Oh, yes, the carpenter's yeah. worm. Yes. So, you want me to tell me yeah. on tank caterpillar or? Carpenter's worms. Oh, this one. All right. Uh, see, you know, yesterday we discussed how difficult it is because it uh, lives in the in the trunk of the uh, the oak tree, and then it suckles, it sucks the sap. Okay. It, it, in order to survive, it needs to suck the sap of the tree. Okay. So for me also, you know, it was a struggle. Okay. How to go about with this because I need certain information and I need to rear this one. So, what I did was, you know, I just uh, um, got the, the I, I actually bought one tree, okay, <laughs> and then the, they uh, cut the tree and then we procured the sample and then 
in that passage, which you, you just saw, three, four passages, I cultured it. Every now and then, I have to uh, replenish with fresh of three. Okay? So that it, I can fit that. So that is how I did for eight months, and then uh, I procured some of the information that I need. But I think uh, it is still ongoing, so I cannot disclose all also, right? Because it may work, it may not work. So that is what I did. Okay, that's all. Thank you, Alok. <laughs> and you short of time, let me not give the final concluding remarks. We all enjoyed your talk. Thank you.
Once again, good morning, all of you. Um, we will be having uh, basically the, the last technical session of the two days session. Uh, this session is titled the nutritional aspect of uh, edible insects. Uh, I'm sure we'll be having a, we'll get inside the, the details in this session. We we'll expect that. Um, the session is going to be chaired by Dr. Lokovic Mokhsi He is a faculty in the Department of Zoology from the Science College. He's been here since 2014. Uh, he did his PhD in uh, fish biology from Nehu under uh, Professor, uh, late, late Professor S. N. Ramanujan. He was an eminent scientist and academician. So, uh, Dr. Rokoliko will now take over the session. Uh, I please uh, invite you to the stage. Thank you, Dr. Ache. For introduction, and now before we start this uh, technical session, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Amlan Das. So, Dr. Amlan Das completed his PhD from uh, Viswa Bharati University in Acritic Biomass and Edibility. He did his uh, postdoc from University of Sao Paulo, Brazil and University of Colorado, USA. He was a visiting scientist at Zoological Research Museum, Alexander Koenig, Germany. He has published several research papers, it was a, sub a subject reviewer in entomolo entomology for several international journals. Currently, he's working as an associate professor in the Department of Zoology, uh, University of Kolkata. So I request the speaker, Dr. Amlam Das. Thank you. Very good morning to everybody. Um, again, I would like to thank Professor Dr. Priyam for inviting for inviting me here to present my talk and his activity. I also thank you to the other eight members and for giving me this opportunity to share my ideas with you. Mm -hmm. I'm thankful to the zoology department at Kojima Science College, the teachers, who also organized this seminar or workshop, dear students and friends. Yesterday I talked with Grasshopper Pond. Now I am delivering some <clears throat> ideas about what kind of nutritional aspects the insects has, the insects have. Before going to present my talk, I I just want to say that in my previous uh, speaker told a lot of information on which regarding the insect nutrition or the nutritional um, nutritional qualities of the insects. Yes, there are so many nutritional qualities in insects. There is a lot of information in the in the websites, in the papers, in the publications. It will take long times to describe all kinds of nutritional aspects of insects. In my talk, I will deliver on three, uh, three objects. Number one, how the insects is better than the other group of meat producing substances or other, other kind of fleshes. Why the insects are advantageous? And number two, is there any laws, regulations, and what kind of rules are there to say that insects would be a new mini livestock for food or feed formulations? What kind of rules are there in the world? Yes. And the last one is that 
is an argument. Argument on edible insects. What kind of argument? I am here. I am listening the edible insects. These are edible. These are edible. Those are edible. Yes. In one word, you can say what you consume that is edible. But in two sense, to me, the edibility is that when once consuming the insects, we don't have any adverse effect, we don't have any toxic effects. That insect should be procured in mass amount, in higher amount, in a larger portion. If they have some potentiality to gather or to rear in mass, those insects you can say edible. Otherwise, one insect I took or tried or something from the wild or catch some some insects from the wild and cook and eat. Yes, it's eatable. It is edible. But until and unless we do research on the insects about their hazardous effects, we cannot say these are edible. So there is a lot of lacunas in this field of research, in this field of science, that all the insects are not edible. <clears throat> until and unless we can do the proper research about their other toxic effects. Because I heard some uh, one lady says here that he is getting or she is getting um, uh, some adverse effects after taking the insects. Yes, there are some. <clears throat> allergens on insects, like other meats or in some vegetables, there are some allergens. But still, if there is some if, if there is some allergen, still you can say that insects are edible because in you know, other people that may not be in other people that may not be allergy. <clears throat> so in my topic, I will say uh, in this three, uh, I will cover these six, these three points. I will try to cover these three points. So these are the edible insects uh, for the sustainable livelihood, and uh, we are talking about the useful aspects of the edible insects and. Why? It doesn't work. This one? So there's, there is a conflict. Insects threats to food security. And we are saying about insects gives us food security. This paper says, it's a science paper, it's, it came out in science magazine. It says the insects threats to food security. And then other, it is an entomological review. Professor Van Hughes, he wrote, the potential of insects as a food and feed in, in assuring the food security. So if there is a conflict. In the agriculturist will say the insects will threat for food security. But the edible insect scientists they will say the insects can ensure the food security. So there is a conflict. So we have to understand what kind of Understandings we need to solve this problem. Yes, there are many questions. There are there are, there are tremendous arguments on these two aspects. Insects face to food security because most of the insects or many of the insects 
or a few insects traits for the crops as pests but there are a lot of insects who are not pests but there is also a conflict some pests are edible for example the grasshoppers locusts these are pests for the crops but these are edible so this argument is to the uh, the director uh, the additional director of uh, department of biotechnology he also argued on this point that some insects traits to the agricultural problems but we are here we are just we are here encouraging people that insects can be a potential use for the food and feed so insects can provide the food security i found one paper from arunachal pradesh to walk on that eight rd people rd tribes they are good that insects can be used to eleven kind of aspects very good insects that they very good insects have have eleven points everybody know its potentiality what kind of eleven points that is food the health the therapeutic use the feeds the bait the cultural value the commercial value entertainment and all of this all of this story story making all of this so this kind of aspects can be covered three insects three edible insects we are good this one so in my previous slide slides i showed that insects can trade to the environment or to the crop and insects can be a can be advantageous for the human mankind not insects can be a good option for the human human mankind for human welfare so based on this we will concentrate our argument or we will concentrate our talk on the favorable parts of the insects which ensure the food security here i can say not the food security but food security is a huge term is a broad aspect food security is a broad aspect we can say the protein security because protein malnutrition you know the quashi that for disease the, the malnutrition due to protein is tremendously prevalent around the world basically in the third world countries so called third world countries in africa and south america and southeast asia and into in india so protein security is very important We have started after Priyam say that the in point in 2050 the India's pop uh, the world population will grow up to like nine billion, and we don't have this amount of food right now to provide the population for it to give them protein security. People don't have money to buy. and we don't have protein as food to provide them here are two pictures or two slides that these people are good that in future supply of animal derived protein for human consumption they projected two lines one it is framed up to 2050 and there is a huge gap of protein demand or protein supply there is a huge gap of protein supply these are the world hunger map it is very much related to protein hunger map and we are in the vulnerable stage india and in other other countries other neighboring countries so here is the gap the straight line here Says the food production in current years, the trend for production up to 2050, and here is the trend. Here is the gap that we require the supply of the additional proteins in terms of additional foods. 
so in it is it is necessary to source the alternative protein now you can add that another aspect in heat formulation the insects can be used as a feed formulation insects can be used as a feed we are just saying these words several times through this meeting in other meeting we so frequently the insects can be used as a feed commercially in fish culture in pet birds in poultry birds in case of aquarium fishes in case of cat chow in case of in case of a uh, 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 duck culture or any other kind of animal husbandry the feeds are produced from some vegetable origin plus some animal origin we cure only 10 to 20% of protein from animal origin in feed formulation what is generally mixed with that we mix with the soybean fish meal generally we use the plant protein the soybean meal in some cases we use the dry fish meal which we harvested from the seas oceans we just dry the fishes and mix it with the fish feed fish meal but all this kind of fishes or the availability of their prices are going high according to the power in the according to the power report in 2015 is all these products are going high or the product price are going high so there are alternatives so these in these alternatives the common alternatives are the farmers they can use the common alternatives which are the soy the other legumes the plant plant leaf algae slaughterhouse waste and hardy compost these are the other alternatives that the, that the farmers can use for feed formulation yes some plant leaves are also used <clears throat> but they have some limitations what kind of limitations they have they have these limitations because the lack of essential amino acids for example the lysine methionine cysteine phenylalanine tyrosine and leucine these these kinds of amino acids are less in case of plant origin supplementary proteins and lack of pufa mufa means polyunsaturated fatty acids and monounsaturated fatty acids these kind of fatty acids are, are essential is good fatty acids are also absent in case of plant derived protein and limitations of different kind of vitamins limitation of different kind of micro and micro and macro nutrients they are inadequate irregular supply and expensive sometimes they are not high hygienic but you can say protein is high we say protein is high hygienic we cannot say but we can argue that these are not high uh, not high hygienic <clears throat> so these are the some limitations these are the common alternatives and it has some limitations so we will go for alternative options for insect protein these are advantages you can say these are advantages so we have to search for alternative protein that we are are going to get before going to that my first that i want to talk uh, want to share my some ideas published in the literature that why we are saying that insects are advantageous than other kind of protein sources other kind of protein sources mean other kind of plant origin protein sources and other kind of animal origin protein sources why the why the insects are advantageous and why the new aspirants new entrepreneurs will be encouraged that they can do some protein food or feed they can they can they can farm some insects they can produce some feed yes you have i know that some of the students have confusion that protein can be used as a food or feed if you have this kind of confusion i think this statements this kind of this kind of information will help you to correct your ideas correct your mind the fact is we know that there is greater efficiency as in i in, in earlier um earlier talk i said the protein and the insects do have the power to convert 
the feed that they consume to a higher biomass in shorter period means what amount of food feed they are provided to eat they convert that feed into their biomass very quickly the pigs the cows or other cattle so insects are advantages the number is lower resource use resource of amount resource amount is less required space is less no waste production and greenhouse emission is less in compared to other fish meat producing animals for example if you see the one to produce the 1 kg of beef 1 kg of pork 1 kg of chicken we know the amount of water the black one is the water amount of leaves required you can just see the ratios i don't want to say you, you just check the ratios what amount of food and food and feed and water is required for cultivation of or for production of beef one kg of beef one kg of pork one kg of chicks in compare to insects oh sir when there is the lower cost than the other conventional meat meat cost Lower cost. Why is this lower cost? The lower cost means we need less investment. We need less investment in production of the meat through insects than the other cattle or the ducks and hens. You can see also the ratios. and higher sources of protein that i already said the higher sources of meat is higher means there is a comparison higher source of protein than the other competitive source of meats if you see the meal ones the amount of meal one required to get a certain amount of protein is less than that of the other meat producing substances so these are the facts there are several other facts they consume they, they emit less carbon dioxide etc and etc i say the, the greenhouse gas emission is very less this for the insects and the another point is that the efficiencies of production of conventional meat and cheese and the crickets what is this this figure represents <coughs> that in case of insects or the ins insects mini livestock we get 80% of protein from from insect mini livestock where we get only 55% from poultry and pigs and 40% from beef other are the carcasses so we just throw them out but in insects we use 80% of their bodies so this is also advantageous for the insects Here is a common approximation of nutritional values. Approximation estimation or approximate estimate estimations of nutritional values in in, in in a few group of insects. You can say the crickets, 60 to 70 percent of protein according to the dry matter dry matter basis. And then if it is in the wet matter basis, it will go to 40 to 40 percent. In fishes, we know that there is the protein percent is 14 percent but it is estimated on the weight matter basis so we have to keep in mind that when you calculate the protein estimation we go only for dry matter basis because there are some other elements and we will limit the elements elements uh through dry so dry matter i will here the data are based on the dry matter 60 to 7 or 70 percent of proteins are there in case of pigs i'm not going for a, a fats and other things because <clears throat> We are concerning about the uh, about the protein. So, in case of grasshoppers, it's near about forty to sixty percent proteins. Only the adults. But in case of neems, the protein percent is goes high. 
but it is another 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 data. There are some flies that are black soldier flies, different flies, near about same amount of the same amount of protein, 55 to 70 percent of proteins in black soldier fly larvae, only the larvae, not the adults. I said the larvae contains a higher amount of protein. So we cannot mix up the adults and the larvae because larvae is always we will get the always greater amount of protein from the larvae. And there are some lesser worms or the uh, meal worms and the caterpillars from the silk worms, larvae. We can see that the meal worms, the protein parts are near about 40, 40 to 60 or 40 to 60, it varies in between these ranges. Whereas in case of the moths that we have last lunch, yesterday's lunch. We have some uh, silkworm larvae, the silkworm, uh, silkworm uh, dishes. So the that, that larvae contains near about 50 to 70 percent of protein. <clears throat> so these are the facts. Yes, there are several facts scattered in this literature. So many facts. These are the pictures from the uh, from the FAO. Uh, Professor uh, Priyam also shared these slides in his slides presentation. I, I, I saw this. These are the distribution of edible insects, but this report is based on 212. And uh, this report was done by the Netherlands, it is Netherlands, uh, Netherlands universities. I think it is done by Professor Han Huy's lab. And he just explained the, what kind of distribution of protein consumption or insect consumption distribution throughout the world. You know, if one insect is found consumed from one country, that country goes to a dark shade. So this this figure doesn't represent the consumption pattern of that country. We cannot say that. We also cannot say that India is a protein consuming country. In some parts of this northeast, they only consume the insects. In some central part of India, they consume insects, but the rest of the Indian population do not consume insects. So this is not a clear picture. This, 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 this can be a blood view, blood picture for consumption of index according to their, according to the country's population. These are the bugs, insects, different kinds of insects. We know that the beetles are highly consumed, right? efficiently consumed, largely consumed. But all are harvested, all are harvested. Not even any of them are cultured in some insect area. The larvae are mostly, are mostly collected. And this, the second order is that caterpillars of Lepidopteran larvae, only the caterpillars from Lepidopteras group. And the third one is the bees, wasps, ants, the hymenopterans. You know, my previous presenter said the Ecophilus maracina, said about the Ecophilus maracina. It is a weaver ant. It is abundant in India, in Southeast Asia. It is in Southeast Asia. This, this Ecophilus, this weaver ant. But there is another weaver ant which is found only in, in, in Africa. In African country, it is restricted. This Ecophila non -Utona. So these two wavelengths are, are in our uh, in our mother earth. Only these two wavelengths in ecophyla group. So these ecophyla, I see, I saw some ecophyla, this maracina, in Australia. They are called the green ants because their abdomen is green. Why their abdomen is green? Because they suck some plant saps. And their cuticle or the exoskeleton is so transparent, so we can visualize from the outside their abdomen. So it looks like green. So it's called green. Ant. They squeeze that green ants and extract some acids, formic acids, and they marinate with marinate the fleshes, marinate the chickens and the beef steaks with that acids. And they use that. You know, in the central and the western 
and the eastern part of the Australia, there are some tribes that there we use that. And the next one is the orthopair. So I am as I, I, I walked throughout my research career walking on orthopera, so I am interested in all these groups. You know, if we, these are the pictures that are all over the world, the insects are consumed because through this picture I will not go in detail all of this in detail all of the facts in this slide, but I will go, I will, I will just tell you. That from Australia, Canada, United States, Mexico, and Thailand, all over the world, the insects are consumed. The insects are consumed according, not according to their energy, energy value. They consume whatever they have from their locality. In so, in our uh, earlier talk, I said that we have to choose if we go for sustainable utilization or sustainable production of insect stock, insect mass culture, we have to select what kind of insects produces higher amount of energy. So they can meet the energy requirement of us, they can meet the protein requirement of us. So these are the facts, these are the documented, documented data. So in documented data, we don't have any plan, what were you found from the wild, we just documented it, we just calculate their energy values, we calculate their protein and all of other factors and we just document it. I know that there are some other slides, there are some other workers. Uh, uh, you showed some slides from Professor Banjo, he is from Kenya. And he showed that, uh, she showed that uh, the, uh, from the African continent, uh, different kind of insects on all nutritional aspects. You should some of the some of banjo slides I saw. But all these kinds of informations are very much document uh, very much documented forms. I mean the insects what they are found from the wild, they are just documented their nutritional aspects. But if you go for the if you, if you have a steady look, what kind of rearing methods or what kind of insects we have to or we need to culture we have to consider their energy value, their protein value, and their fat values. Because we have to keep in mind that the protein value should be higher and the fat value should be lower. If it is not, we will consider only the protein value and the energy value. And these are the groups that are all kind of forms are used, larvae, adult, eggs, males, females, all kinds of, all kinds of Forms of the insects can be used throughout the world. This data is also a documented data. You can see the orthopeda, hymenopeda, all the orders. I will not go for that. <clears throat> all, all parts of the insect body parts can be used. They can be used, cooked, half cooked, in part, in full, any kind, of, all kinds of. Robert. Uh, uh, Yes, Robert Koch in 1981, he also wrote one paper that how he was an anthropologist and blog writer. He said that how, uh, how, uh, what kind of insects we need to culture. In Bodenheimer in 1951, you saw it. He wrote one book, Insects. Before that, in 1950s, butterfly in my stomach. He wrote another book in 1950s. In 1981, Professor Dean Gene DePollier, he is now an emeritus scientist from USA. He is the pioneering worker on insect farming. And later, Professor Van Hughes from Washington University of Netherlands and his associate professor, Professor Dick. He is also working on this edible insect farming. So how good? A lot of things, protein, fats, carbohydrates, calcium, cytons, vitamins, calories, etc. etc. So this figure 
we will need to understand the kind of comparison. The calcium, iron, these two figures, these two facts are important because we are recommending the insects, insect protein when we are recommend when we recommend the insect protein for the woman, for the pregnant woman. Because in the African countries, in South Asian countries, the pregnant woman needs some protein as foods. So calcium content and the, and the iron content should be high. And we have to care on that point when we culture the insects. In case of grasshoppers, <clears throat> Is protein at about 60 to 65 percent in some cases. Stratostomer, this is my lab data. This spatula, I just cited here a few here, and then I will cite my detailed lab data. What we had, what we have done. This is a protein in stratostomer is 65, whereas another is 59, near about 60. Fat is near about 70 to 50 percent. So this grasshoppers is also a tremendous source of protein. The grasshoppers, 100 gram of the grasshoppers can produce the 14 grams of protein. So when we will not de weaned, when we will not process the grasshoppers. But when we get processed, the grasshoppers will serve 20 grams of protein. This is the processing facts, factors. So processing, insect processing is a very good important information. Insect process is very good inform uh, is a is a is a Important aspect. In raw insects, you will get what amount of protein. In processed insects, you will get the higher amount of protein. In some cases, in you know, there is a, there is one protein insect from EU funded project. You know, European Union funded project, protein insect project. They also described very clearly how the processed insects can serve the higher amount of protein. I will show that slide, one slide of them. So the processed grasshopper, this is a survey. This is called the amount per survey. That is the processed grasshopper. The processed grasshoppers, you know the calories, 153, fat is 6, and protein goes high. <clears throat> If we compare with other, other meat producing substances, the crickets and mealworms, in compared to the salmon, the fishes, eggs, beefs, and tofus, tofus is another kind of soybean originated protein. If we compare this protein structure or uh, protein feature, to other meat producing, other, other protein, uh, protein serving elements, we can see that the insects, the crickets and the mealworms serves better or competitive. So if it is competitive, why you go for insects? I will show you in, other, in, in, our, in previous slides that why are insects are advantageous and on what points the insects are advantageous. For example, if we see the nutritional values of the grasshoppers, that is 150, 171 milligram of calcium. So when you get the grasshoppers in the same amount of the substances, that is from milk, we get only 125 milligram of calcium. The same amount of the same same weight of the Substances will get higher amount of calcium from grasshoppers than the milk. If we go for iron, it is 8.7 milligram compared to spinach. It is 4.41 gram of fibers compared to green beans. There are other factors in the IPIF. This is the European Union's uh, this uh, this this farming uh, uh, agencies or farming association. We can say this platform is a platform 
is based on ego and they they they, they provide very good information what kind of nutrients minerals vitamins amino acids are there look at ferrous phosphorus zinc magnesium vitamin b1 b2 and b12 so these point on these points the insects are grow insects are advantageous over the other bees in our lab we analyzed 48 species of grasshoppers there are some pictures of these grasshoppers in this 48 picture 48 grasshoppers we analyze their protein content this this on these grasshoppers and we found that protein content varies from 40 9 to 65% of proteins in all these 38 grasshoppers these are their abbreviated names in the grasshoppers for example e g z t d j and t f in case of males if we go for the females we can see that the protein content is near about more or less equal if we see the carbohydrate components we analyze the carbohydrate components all these party species of grasshoppers according to their male and the female so it was a huge task So we found that the carbohydrates varies from 2.5 mg per 100 g to 3.5 mg or near about 4 mg per 100 g of tissues. And in case of females, the carbohydrates a little bit of higher. Next, we analyze the lipids. in 48 species of grasshoppers according to the male and female we found that the females these are the male these are the male uh, carbohydrate ratios uh, carbohydrate con- uh, sorry uh, lipid contents near about 3.5 to 4.5 or 5% whereas in case of female it, it is little bit higher you know the in 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 females uh they have the higher amount of fat bodies so they are lipid contents goes higher so these facts says the grasshopper should be a good option than other insects why the grasshoppers are good option i said you are here so these nutritional facts of grasshopper from 38 species of grasshoppers where we have analyzed we are now analyzing their vitamins their minerals and what kind of Mm-hmm. um micro and the macro minerals are there what kind of vitamins are there what kind of amino acids essential amino acids are there we are just selecting five essential amino acids methionine methionine cysteine arginine uh, and uh, and another two uh, phenylalanine and leucine and lysine too so we are just analyzing this these the these document uh, analyzing their uh, tissues my lo- my lab is working on that so then we will get a clear picture of what kind of nutritional profile is in grasshoppers pears what kind of nutritional profile they have so when we get the nutritional profile of all these grasshoppers and when we will compare those grasshoppers to their potentiality in producing biomass then we can select these are the ideal grasshoppers these are the ideal 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 insects ideal grasshopper insects ideal grasshopper species then we can recommend the people we can recommend you we can recommend the farmers goes for these species so on this and we are also doing some toxic and analysis because it's also important if we don't know you know in south in south southern part of the india there are some white lizards species It's toxic. It's very beautiful, brilliantly colored grasshoppers, but it's somehow it's, it is it is poisonous. But still, we do not know what about the other toxic components in these grasshoppers. So we have to analyze this, and after that, we can say that we go for these grasshoppers, we go for these insects. So 
just we can say these are edible i will not say this word these are edible yes we can eat we have eaten we have eaten some things based on the why but i cannot remember that until unless we have a data set data bank the next one is that how oh, is there is a comparative uh, 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 figures of thirty years of us we say we, we can we found the male and female protein content more or less equal though the female uh, uh, yeah, in case of male the protein content is little bit of higher but in case of female the lipid content is little bit of higher okay in our yes sorry i said that there are some uh, basic requirements are needed for gas for farming but all over the world the farm the insects very systematically very scientifically look at their scientific farm of insect farm very houses they build such kind of insect rearing farms and they use the insects and they keep the insects in a dryer they dry it and then go grow for grinding and after grinding they estimated their nutritional values they then pack it and then sell it for the market so this is the this is the systematic way of farming of insects rather than to do something in a household because if you go for commercial purposes you have to set up some kind of things which are very much hygienic otherwise the western people will not accept your food yes you can sell it in some local people but you want you want to sell some in, in some good grocery in some good shopping malls the product in a packed insect powder then you have to take care of this so these are the how how to improve the protein content this is the facts that i have cited uh, from the protein insect uh, project from european union they say that there are some solvent factors after grinding solvent extraction is very important when we get the proteins in higher amount you see the filtration and centrifugation is important and after centrifugation we will get the solvent fractions and when we evaporate the solvent we will get the residues that is the fat bodies and these fats are important for the production of insect oil so in this industry as well as when we get the protein content you will get the insect oil in other ways use with some enzymes and solvents you can use that you can hydrolyze that proteins and you will get the some amino acids and chitinins that chitin industry the production of chitin industry is also a growing industry in the world right now i i i, I said in all your sites that they are used for uh, uh, pharmaceutical purposes or in cosmetic purposes cosmetic industry the chitin industry so there are some regulation we know that the insects and foods insects as food and feed there are some laws in europe in europe in china australia and all over the world there are some laws that are implemented but we do not have any laws in india still now we hard in uh, in 2050 the dvt plan some implemented or have uh, raised some ideas arranged some plans for laws on insects as food and feed but i do not know the outcome of that um, of, of of that uh, oscillations so these are the codex elementary years commission's report in this report this is the codex elementary years commission uh, it is its headquarters is in geneva switzerland they say the what kind of food we can eat they comment they can just make a number so insects in, in this is the fact in 2015 they say that the insects which kind of insects they only say that some insect food only a specific insect food insects can be used as a food and they made it the number this is their expression number c c a s i a i 7 this number is been allocated for the insects as food and feed which kind of insects before going that 
After 2015, there are other laws implemented in the USA, in Canada, in Europe, and in Australia. The FDA, you know, the FDA and the EPA, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, and the FDA, that is the Food and Drug Administration agencies, both are based in USA. They recommend if the insects food. They consider as GRAS. GRAS means generally recognized as safe. Generally recognized as safe. But they are not 100% sure. Uh, they are not 100% recommended the insects can be Though the research is going on very geometrically. So after that, in 2000, after 2050, there is another convention in Geneva and Codex International uh, uh, Societies in 2017. They recommended only three insects as food and feed. These three insects get recommendation from Codex Alimentarius International Geneva. These three insects are the house crickets, the European locust, and the minnows. Only three insects. Only these three insects. Though we are saying that many kinds of insects are edible and like these, but the Codex International they say they recommended only three insects. These are some facts, you know, it very well that insects can be used. So I just will summarize my talk. These are some culinary books, which is written by Julia Ramos Eloardi. She was a very prominent scientist from Mexico. She was a scientist from Ponasa in Mexico. She wrote this book, Piki Chronic Cuisine, and the Eat a Baku book, which was written by God, George God. There are some other books too, but these books are very famous, are very authentic. And there are some videos from Ramos in YouTube that how she cooked the insects, what kind of recipes, what kind of ingredients they are using in insect preparation. In, in, in our uh, yesterday, some two chefs came here and they are using uh, insects as they are cooking the insects in different ways. So these books may help her. And him. this is the journal, you know. The insects as food and feed. And the chief editor is Professor Van Huys. This journal was implemented in 2014 or like this. It's not a very old journal. But at today's date is get impact 3.8. Impact factor is 3.8, it goes very high. Now I will summarize my talk with two slides. One published in Nature in 2014, 14, time to eat insects, and another in science. Why insects could be the ideal for human feed in 2015? In two subsequent years, the authors write in two deputy journals that why insect use, why time to eat insects, and time to eat an ideal for human feed. So one is for internal mechanism, and one is for food, and one is for feed. There are several other citations. I will not go for that because it will go longer time. With this, I must conclude my talk. Thank you very much. So much, uh, sir, for your presentation, and uh, now I open uh, to the house for any question. Any question from the house? Sir, yes, your. When you talk about the toxin concept, yes, I think that's a really interesting thing that you keep for the piece to yes. around. <clears throat> Do you have any data that you can? No, I don't have any data. 
I don't have any data. We are, yes, definitely there are some data in the literature <coughs> that some pathogens are there on the insects. When you will dry the insects, when you will eat the insects in their digestive tract, in their exoskeletal, ex exoskeletal, you will find some pathogens. So you have to wash out these insects. You have to clean those insects or very carefully and very properly. So they are recommending insects as insect powder. When you, do this, when you powder the insects on the insect meal, is insect powder and insect meal, then you can pass the insects biomass to some hygienic standards or hygienic machines or hygienic ways. So you will get the less contaminated insect biomass. And insect powder is very much essential for these days because if you target the larger or larger larger people or if you target for the larger consumers, they may not have to, they may not get the insects, raw insects or intact insects, but they can get the insect powder and they use that insect powder for food fortification. So food fortification is a Growing industry or food fortification using the insects is a growing industry. You can use the insects in flour, in wheat flour, you can use the insects in breads, like soya chunks. We use the soya chunks in our flour. So use that insect flour in your bread so that the infants, the childs, can also consume the insects. Or you can use the insects in different ways, not with the intact insect, because there is negativeness when you visualize the insects in some people. But when it is in the powdered form, they are not getting, they are get, they are not visualize the insects. What is is is, is kind of uh, what kind of uh, adverse or kind of yes. So there should not be any negative impact to the consumers. So in food fortification, there are several opportunities. And in food, through food fortification, you can use the insect meals in different ways. And so you can cover a larger group of consumers of any animals. And you can use the particular portion of insect protein because you know 14 to 10 to 14 percent insect portion is required for the any kind of food. More than that, if you use more than insect protein, then you cannot digest. In food and also in feed formulation too. So if you use the insect powder, then you have regulations in your own hand. You can use the insects, the what kind of what portion of insects protein is required, have, have to add, need to add in some foods, need to add in some for food part fortifications. That is that would be in your hand. So you can maintain the properties of the food. I don't have any pathogen ideas. I uh, yes, I have some pathogen ideas, but I don't have any pathogen ideas on commercial insects because the research on the pathogens, research on the uh, research on the toxics, toxic substances on edible insects is not so much. It's not so much. In fact, the edible insect research is not so much. Only the uh, I said there are only some review works and documentations and some uh, 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 and the diversity knowledge are there in the literature. Any questions? Any more questions? Okay, thank you.
you. Okay, thank you so much. Sir. Okay, before we wind up this session, uh, okay, we will uh, want to honor our two speakers uh, with a memento. So uh, now uh, I call upon uh, Sir Serbia to give away the momentos. Uh, can you?
This is the thoracic region. This is the sorry. This is the head region. In head region, you can see the eyes. There are a pair of eyes. This is the anterior attachment. This is the simple eye, which is known as ocelli. This is the thoracic region. This is the dorsal view, and this is the lateral view. This is the wing attachment. Here you can see the three pairs of legs. And this is the morphology of Orthoptera. In Orthoptera, we can see the grasshoppers, short horn grasshoppers, long horn grasshoppers, crickets, and grillo tactics, small crickets, and other grasshoppers. There you can see the forewing, which is pretty hard than Hymenoptera, but not much hard than Coriopera. The hind wings are membranous and transparent. This is the antennal segments, this is the head region, pronotum, abdomen, and look at the hind legs. This is the third pair of legs, which is very enlarged. That's why really, they are they can easily hop in to the ground and hop in the ground. So they can be known as grasshoppers. This is a taxonomy key. Why we use taxonomy keys? For only for the identification purpose. In taxonomy keys, there are different parts. This is the first one. There you can see two different lines. This is known as first lead and second lead. This is something very technical. Don't confuse that. This is the first lead and this is the second lead. All together we can call it as a couplet. So the important structure of a taxonomy key comprised by several couplets. This is the first couplet. Then you can see two different leads. In these two different leads, you can see the different characters. The first character, you can see the, uh, the workshop material. The first character is four wings membranous. Four wing membranous and we give the corresponding figure number, figure one, which is the right below the each leaf. Okay, you can see the four wing membranous. Then second character is abdomen constricted basally. The abdomen is constricted basally like this. Okay, so we can only give the different characters which is very opposite to that we given in the first leaf. Four wings hard, not membranous, not transparent, which is very hard. Com not completely membranous. In some groups, the four wings are membranous epically. It is very hard basally. It is very hard in the region. Uh, it connects to the body. Okay. Then abdomen broad basally. You can clearly see the difference here. This is very broad basally, but this is very narrow basically. This is the first couplet. In the first couplet, four wings membranous, abdomen constricted basally, which will forward into the second couplet. In the first lead, you can easily identify the hymenoptera. Why it has got such a name, hymenoptera? The hymen is known as membranous. Tera means wings. So, altogether, we can call it as Hymenoptera, the insects with membranous wings. Okay. Then, second lead is forward into the third couplet. I will discuss later. Third couplet. This is the second couplet. Okay. We have only two families. I only put two families here because of the uh, we can easily identify these two families. Okay. 
In first lead, you can see several characters. You can say first character is eyes pear shape imaginated in the middle. This is the structure of the eye, which is very imaginated in the middle, just like a pear, pear shape. That's why we call it as pear shape, imaginated or notch medial. There is a notch in the medial region, like this. Second character is pronotum. Pronotum is the first thoracic region. First thoracic region is head then thorax, then abdomen. In the thoracic region, we again divided it into three parts. Prothorax, mesothorax, metathorax. The pronotum is connected with prothorax, which is inverted U-shape, the yellow region. Inverted U-shape. Then, hind leg without tuft of hairs. What do you mean by tuft of hairs? In several insects, we can see the hairs distributed all over the body. But there is, in one family, in apidae, we know that apids are apis bees, honeybees. They are well-known pollinators. So, keeping the pollens together, they need some equip, equipped structures, like the pollen basket. That's why in this couplet, you can see in this image, there is a tuft of hairs. Hairs are there. The cetocity and the distribution of hairs is very huge in this group. Okay, so by these three characters, you can identify the family Vespide, in which the horrors are there. Vespidae Vespid is the family. We can see many type of hornets. Okay, hornets, paper was, and uh, <coughs> you have seen the giant hornets yesterday. So these insects are belonging to this particular family. And honeybees are there in the epidemic. Okay, so we can clearly see the difference. Here you can see eyes are pear shaped, but here eyes not pear shaped. There is no notch here, deep notch here. That's why they are different. We can select maximum taxonomical characters, we can select maximum morphological difference to make the taxonomy key. Only with taxonomy key, you can identify what insects we have. What, the, what are the different kinds of insects we have only with the taxonomy key. Then second character is pronotum not U-shaped. It is much transverse here. No invertedly U-shaped. Then hind leg with hind leg with tuft of face. There you can see many tuft of hairs in the hind leg. Okay, with these three characters, you can identify the apidae. In apidae, the family comprises of different kinds of honeybees. There are different kinds of small honeybees are there, large honeybees are there. I think there are three or five honeybees are known as edible hymenoptera. Apis dorseta, Apis serana, Apis mellifera, all these are edible and have several kinds of medicinal and therapeutic values. This is the third couplet. This is the third couplet. This is the lead which will forward into that third couplet. From the we have the samples with wings are hard. From third couplet, we can only identify the insects in which they have the hard forewings, not the membranous one. We already identified 
the insects with membranous wings here on from third couplet we have to start to identify the insects with hard wings okay is it clear then the first lead is something uh, describing the coleopterans the long horn beetles and some weevils are there some another book crested jewel beetles are there there we can see the different characters forming very hard without wing veins very hard without wing veins that's why they are known as coleoptera the term coleoptera is put forward with the combination of coleops plus tera coleops means hard tera means again wings all together we can call it as coleoptera the insects with hard wings hard sclerotized wings first character is forming very hard without wing veins second character head without ocelli the simple eyes in this group we cannot see the simple eyes which is situated in the dorsal side okay then next character is head directed forwards the level of the head with respect to the thoracic region which is referred as prognathous head simply the head directed forwards okay then we can go to the fourth couplet there we can identify two families of coleoptera in the second lead there is something very different characters are there forming not very hard with wing veins these are the wing veins you can clearly see the wing veins here then head with ocelli dorsally there are three ocelli are there on the dorsal side of the head and the third character is head directed downwards the head is directed downwards by these character we can identify sorry we can forward the couplet into fifth one in the fourth couplet we can identify the ceramicidae commonly known as long horned beetle why these are known as long horned beetle because of they have long antennae this one long antennae and another family is asalidae in this couplet you can see several characters here antenna very long with long segments antenna is much longer than the body and with very long segments this is the work, one segment which is very long then i pear shape just like in vespidae we can only see the eyes which are pear shape which is deeply notched in the middle region then forming without longitudinal striations forming are very simple very smooth without any markings or striations by these characters by the combination of these characters we can identify the ceramicidae this is a very important coleopteran group in entomophagy then next region you can see the different characters and in a short with bead like segments not the long one here you can see the long segments but here you can see the very short segments just like this not the long ones just the short beaded like segments eyes not pear shape there is no distinct notch here but we can see the distinct notch here in ceramicidae by these characters you can identify the passaridae which is the family we have collected several specimens of this from this family from northeast india
here you can see the you can differentiate how we can differentiate the orthoptera and hemiptera orthoptera means the insect with something very uh, less hard forewings insect with less hard forewings not much hard we can see you have seen in the coleoptera group the first category is antenna long with more than eight segments here you have to check you have to examine how many segments are there in their antenna like the segments in legs and other structures how many segments you can easily count it with the help of microscope or a good hand lens okay here antenna long with more than eight segments cutellum which is a triangular part can be seen can be seen in the dorsal region of the thorax then hind legs enlarged this is the third pair of legs which is very enlarged for jumping that's why they are known as grasshoppers then the next leaf you can see three characters antenna short with less than eight segments this is very clear here you can see the long antenna with more than eight segments here you can see only less than eight segments in their antenna then scutellum is large here you cannot see the any triangular structures but you can clearly see the triangular structures here this is the scutellum okay hind legs not enlarged this is very simple hind legs which is not enlarged like in orthoptera in orthoptera there are two major families grillidae and acrididae in grillidae they are long horned crickets the antennae are very long with more than 11 or 20 or 30 segments in acrididae we can call it as short horned grasshopper okay how we can identify grillidae we can identify grillidae only with these characters which is included in the first leaf this is the first leaf this is the second leaf antenna long you can clearly see the length of antenna here then abdomen with a pair of anal segments structures anal cerci and pronotum wider than long here you can see the pronotum it is wider than long that means the width is high than the length this is the width this is the length that's why we call call it as wider than long all these characters from all these characters we can identify different species of grillidae different species of crickets the next leaf you can see the antenna short abdomen without anal filaments pronotum longer than wide the exact opposite characters which we put in the first leaf by these characters you can clearly identify you can easily identify the acridic grasshoppers the short horned grasshoppers here you can see two different leaves from first leaf you can identify the dinidorids dinidoridae is the family where we can see the corydias species the bugs corydias species and cicadidae is the another kind of bugs we have all the specimens in first leaf forming moderately hard not very hard which is very moderately hard then scutellum triangular here is the scutellum triangular figure 36 then antenna with 4 to 5 segments by these characters you can identify the dinidoridae and in second leaf forming transparent with 
wings wing wings can be seen then scutellum mostly rectangular and antenna with less than five segments these are the characters which we can follow to identify the specimens we have there are only eight families are there and we have put eight families because of that these families are very important these families are easily collected these families are very abundant in northeast india okay thank you Hi. So now that the presentation is over, we have displayed the insects uh, over there, so you people can come and take a look of the insects. And once the hall is ready, each person will be given two insects on a slide, so you can observe the characters which are mentioned in the material provided to you. You can try to see how, uh, try to analyze those characters yourself, and we are there to help you if you are having any doubts about it. Try to identify which group that insects belongs to. Whether it is a grasshopper, whether it is a beetle, or if it is a bee, vast like that. So we are there to help you. For now, you can just come and take a look at the insect. And once the hall is ready, we'll be shifting to that hall, and you can work on the insects. All right.